When I'm watering these two beds of apple seedlings, I have to keep the hose moving pretty much constantly. I'll, you know, water one a little bit and then I'll water the other one a little bit and then I'll actually have to stop and wait for the water to soak in. Otherwise, it'll start running off the beds. This is caused by something called soil crusting, which is a major gardening problem. So today I'm gonna to talk about soil crusting, what it is, why it's a problem, and some strategies to prevent it. Now, normally I would have prevented it already on these beds, but I've been saving them for like a month or something to make this video, and including a lot of the other beds in my garden. So they're pretty bad right now, um, which is good because then I can demonstrate uh, why this is a problem. So yeah, I'm sitting here still waiting and the water is just puddled on the surface of the bed. Soil is not just mineral earth. For good healthy soil, you need to have a soil with a structure and a soil that breathes. When you walk around on the ground, don't think of it as like, here's the air and then the air stops and the solid ground starts because that's not actually how it works. There's a certain amount of pore space and air in the soil and the exchange of air with the soil is important. So is the structure because the structure of the soil allows water to come in and it allows air to get in. And it also allows bugs to move around in there and roots to grow through it easily. So if I were to take a chunk of healthy soil, let's just dig up, you know, underneath here, the soil is good. It's structured and everything. So this crumbles apart. You know, it falls into little, nice little crumbles. This is great. Now, if I take this and I add a bunch of water to it and just squish it even once, most of that structure is destroyed. If I kind of squish it up like that and then let that dry, this is what, you know, forms soil crust. Now I can also take dry soil, like on the end of the bed here where I'm not watering, and if I crush that up, it forms a powder. So what happens when you add water to powder? It makes mud, which again is gonna form a soil crust. So of course there are um, soils and dirt on the planet that aren't structured like this, but for plant growth, like the, the kinds of plants that most people grow, you definitely want a structured, crumbly soil that has pore space and allows water to flow through it freely. So that all segues into why soil crusting is a problem. Again, we want air in the soil. The soil microorganisms rely on having this air and exchange of gases. So gases are leaving the soil and we want the air to get down in there. It carries not just oxygen, but nitrogen and carbon dioxide and whatever else. When you form a soil crust and you stop that um, interaction of the air and the soil, that inhibits plant growth. And in my experience, it seems like if you cultivate that away and keep an open surface that plants just grow better. And I think a lot of gardeners have probably, and farmers have observed that and would probably agree with me. Yeah, that's one problem. Here's another problem. Again, with the water, the water goes in slower and it leaves faster. In the crust, because all the soil particles are kind of connected together, it sort of forms a wick and the water leaves the soil. Now there are, studies showing that it's as as good or better for soil moisture to leave the surface undisturbed as it is to cultivate it and break it up but i'm very skeptical of those studies just from my personal observation and also the fact that traditional farming in general is almost always based on cultivation i'm not saying that's the only way to do things but people do it for reasons and, and it does work and then one other factor with the water is the water also doesn't spread as evenly because it's traveling down very slowly. It just doesn't seem like in a well-structured open soil, the water will seep down very quickly and then kind of spread out. But with a really compacted soil like this, it kind of goes down really slow and it just doesn't seem to go as far, honestly. And then it comes out easily. If you don't water enough, you can easily form like this thing where you have wet on the top but dry on the bottom. And down here lower is where all the roots are. So you definitely want to water enough to, to make sure that the water is getting all the way down there. I water these every day and um, that's enough to keep them moist. But just if I let them dry out a lot and then sat here trying to water them, it would be very difficult to get them fully saturated without putting a sprinkler on here for a couple of hours. So let's go look at another little area over here with a really badly crusted bed. And then we'll discuss some ways to prevent this terrible, horrible problem. 
So here are my peppers growing in some badly crusted soil. They don't look uh, too horrible. They actually look pretty healthy, but they'll definitely appreciate the soil being opened up so that you know air and water can move through the soil more easily. So what happens is as the water is falling, it pounds and pounds the surface of the soil and creates basically mud, which then com you know it compacts it and then it dries into this sort of crust. And this is, it's pretty hard. Um, even damp, this is hard, and it has very little structure to it. There's definitely some structure and there's some organic matter in there, but it's, yeah, pretty, pretty unideal. So one way to prevent this is by cultivation. So I'll often use a hula hoe and just bring it under the surface of the soil like that because I like to keep some material on the surface of the bed and this kind of just cuts under and breaks up the crust and doesn't really dig too much. It doesn't really disturb the soil that much. I'm just kind of slicing underneath the soil surface. Now traditional farming basically relies on cultivation like I said and typically that will be more like this where you're chopping the soil up and really loosening it and forming uh, at least three inch you know maybe like four to six inch layer of pulverized soil. So what's going to happen is this is going to dry out but then it's going to kind of stop the water from leaving the soil. So since this is all fluffy now when I water again, the water's going to go in very easily. But since I'm messing up the soil structure, I'm all chopping it up and messing it up, then it's going to form a crust again. So you have to just keep doing this. It basically uh, creates the same problem that it's solving. So one option we have here is to cover the soil with stuff. And that's kind of what happens in nature again. You know, the grass and leaves all die and they cover the soil and protect it. Sometimes there's a layer of moss on the ground. So anything you can do to put a physical barrier on top of the soil is great. Now, ideally, that's going to be something that's going to rot down and feed the soil eventually and encourage bugs to get under there and work and loosen the soil surface up. So on here, I have, you know, some compost sifted to do half an inch. There's probably some coffee grounds in here, some little bits of uh, oyster shell and lime stuff like that, anything. So I'll usually plant my stuff, smooth off the bed, and then put down a layer of as much stuff as I have. However, I don't ever even have enough stuff to completely cover all of the beds. And that just requires a whole lot of compost because it takes a huge pile of material to make a small amount of compost. Of course, I can put you know straw and leaves on here and those are big and they're gonna last for a long time. They're gonna do a really good job of covering the soil, but you know that can bring other problems with it. I have a lot of voles, which is, uh, they're also called meadow mice. They're like these short little stubby rodents with short tails. And they like to burrow under stuff. They love living under mulch. And also have like earwigs and sow bugs and whatever. I mean, lots of stuff that would like to live under there and then march, um, you know, a whole few inches to eat my plant, whatever it is. So typically I don't use a lot of heavy mulches. I do use them in certain areas. It's, again, it's just another, all these things are tools and you just kind of have to use them where they fit the best. If you reject all of them for one, just one of them, uh, chances are you're gonna find a place where it just doesn't work for you at some point. So of course the way this works is when the water falls, it hits this stuff first instead of hitting the soil. And so it doesn't end up pulverizing the soil. And again, there's bugs and like worms coming up to eat this stuff and they, will you know loosen the surface of the soil underneath here so even a small amount even if it doesn't completely cover like you can see mineral patches of mineral soil right here um, it still makes a huge difference like i know the difference between watering this bed and one with less organic matter on the top of it another option is to put so much organic matter in the soil like little bits of twigs and bark and stuff that it's basically like potting mix so potting mix will be mostly like, you know, bark and twigs and stuff like that. Maybe a little bit of sand, maybe some perlite, but there's usually no actual mineral soil when you buy potting mix. That's very difficult to get that much organic matter unless you're buying in truckloads of stuff. I mean, sure, if you have a couple raised beds in your backyard and you can afford to buy a bunch of compost and get that up to like where it's 50% organic matter, then that's fine. But in a garden situation like mine, the amounts of organic matter required to get the soil high enough to where it really prevents soil crusting, I mean, it can definitely help. But to prevent it, you know, that's, uh, it's, it's almost impossible. It's, it's just ridiculous amounts of organic matter. However, um, this bed has charcoal in it. And if you were to use something that doesn't rot, 
like charcoal or perlite or vermiculite maybe, I'm not really sure, and get that into a really high level in the soil, then that may prevent it. So in this case, a lot of the larger pieces of charcoal have kind of floated to the top, so they're sort of protecting the surface, but there's also, I mixed in 50% charcoal in the top about six inches of this soil. So that definitely makes a difference. You know, it, it pretty much, as far as I've noticed, this bed doesn't really crust up to the point where the water doesn't soak in, and that's like really the main thing that I want. So this is pretty encouraging, but the soil below this, it's dug down to two feet, and there's a ton of charcoal in it, like 33% in the whole bed. But if I start digging that, like say I plant potatoes here and then I dig them up, I'm gonna dig all that 33% charcoal up and it's gonna get on the surface. And then eventually this top surface is not gonna be 50% charcoal anymore. So anyway, that's somewhat encouraging. I'm actually encouraged by the results. Uh, I don't know how that'll play out in the long run. So I'm really interested in this as a way to permanently solve this problem in a long-term garden. And I don't know what kind of potential it really has, but something that solves the problem rather than sort of making it less worse or you know, watering and messing it up and then fixing it over and over and over again seems pretty compelling. It's compelling enough to pursue, even if it uses ridiculous amounts of charcoal, just to see, just to see how well it will work because it's a big difference. It's a big difference in maintenance not to have to mess with it. You know, if we can just water our soil and then leave and be done with it and come back and water it again and again and again and again and not develop these problems, that would just be swell. Okay, so one last thing we're gonna look at here, let me grab the hose, is the manure mat. So this is an idea I came up with a few years ago. I've been playing with it for a while and I really like it. Um, these plants don't look particularly healthy. They're, you know, messed up for other reasons. They're eaten by bugs and stuff. But look at how the water behaves on here. You know, I can water the same spot for a long time and I'm not getting any runoff yet. Look at all that water and it's just going into the soil. I stop watering and it just slurps it right up. Huge, huge difference. So manure mats are cool. I'm gonna do another video on those, but let's just, let me just summarize real quick. It's basically, I make manure tea. So I make the tea and I use the tea a bunch of times. Like I keep adding water and then using the water. And then eventually I get this sludge that doesn't have as many nutrients in it, but although it still has quite a bit. I mix that up and then I just pour it on the bed and let it sit there all season like this. And it forms basically like, it's like paper, really. All the fibers in there kind of lock it together. Um, it's really not as gross as it sounds. Sometimes it'll smell pretty bad for a day or two, but often it actually doesn't. And then for the rest of the summer, it doesn't smell at all. So as you can imagine, this provides a lot of benefits. For one thing, I can sit here and just blast the surface of the soil with water. If I did that on mineral soil, it would completely pulverize the surface of the soil and make mud. Also, every time I water it, I'm leaching more nutrients out and they go down straight to the plant roots. Eventually, all this stuff's gonna get kind of broken up and incorporated into the soil, add more organic matter. It's gonna end up there anyway, like if I threw it in the compost or something, it's just doing a lot more good on the way if I use it this way. It really helps with evaporation, so it's kind of sealing and covering a blanket over the soil to keep the sun off and to keep water from leaving as easily. And all around it just pretty much rocks. It, you know, it's obviously very porous. You know, if I can water it as much as I was here and you can see the water just keeps soaking in. So clearly there's an, a good exchange of air with the soil. And since the soil is open, the water can go deeply quickly. So there's kind of a soil crusting 101. If you're a beginning gardener and you see this start to happen after rains and watering and you get this kind of smooth surface starting to develop, at least get out there with a hoe and bust it up. For me, I like to keep the surface covered with a little bit of mulch, even if I don't have enough to cover the whole bed thoroughly. I want to keep that on the surface. So what I'll do as a compromise a lot of the time, I do this a lot, is I'll take a strap hoe. This is also called a stirrup hoe and a hula hoe. It's got all kinds of different names. And I just drag this underneath the surface of the soil about an inch. And if you get it just right and it's relatively sharp, 
you'll kind of cut under the soil and break up that crust a little bit, but kind of leave it intact on the surface at the same time. So that's a pretty good compromise. I also use this hoe quite a bit the same way. This is made by Rogue Hoe. I think it's their four or five inch garden hoe. Um, not sure, but this is also made, it's set at an angle that's good for dragging underneath the soil. Although since this part is in the way, it's not quite as good as a stirrup hoe, but this is a really nice multi-purpose hoe for kind of garden cultivation. And of course you can play with the other options I mentioned and it's important, whatever you do, do something. It's pretty hard for me to keep up a lot of the time and I, get, I end up with getting these crusts and using sprinklers and the water's running off the beds. You know, um, what's ideal to do in real life don't always intersect very well. And uh, while we're sitting here, check out my apple seedlings. These three are showing very strong red pigment. And these are crosses between a small, very red fleshed crab apple called maypole. It has red flesh, red skin, red bark, red wood, red flowers, pretty much everything's red about it. The other parent is chestnut crab, which is a small, you know, it's bred from crab apples and regular sized apples, but it's very small, it's extremely tasty, very high sugar, excellent apple. So the intersection between those two sets of genes seems like it holds a lot of potential. But then again, we won't know that for four or five years. So, you know, patience. Are they done yet?